rising.
so happy to accept the recommendations of the report. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So on to our next agenda item, uh, which is going to be presented to us by Peter. Okay. Thank you, Chair. This report provides members with details of the funds initial submission to the building consultation. It seeks members' approval for officers to continue to develop proposals in consultation with the chair um, and for our final response, ideally to be brought to the committee in June. Uh, the deadline for it is the 15th of July, so our intention is to have, have that available for June's pension committee. And then finally, um, our response to the investment regulation consultation is also attached as an appendix. Under Section 2 is set out the background. Uh, at the end of November, uh, the government issued uh, their consultation um, and reports were called both to November and January Pensions Committee, uh, setting out the government's criteria, four criteria that they're assessing. Uh, one is that each pool should have at least 25 billion of assets. Uh, we needed to set out uh, government's arrangements likely cost savings um, and our ambitions in relation to the development of infrastructure. Initial proposals were required by the 19th of February and our response was uh, made by the deadline. As we found the 2.3 refined and completed submissions were required by the 15th of July and they require a great deal more information um, in response to those four criteria. 2.4, the fund has met with a number of mainly normal based uh, pension LGPS funds over the last three or four months. Um, and as a consequence of those meetings, uh, the fund has effectively agreed to work so far with two other funds, Greater Manchester Pension Fund and the Shortshire Pension Fund. Um, collectively, we will have assets of about £35 billion. Pounds. Uh, there are appendices to this report which provides some more information um, on potential pooling arrangements. Uh, apologies for the amount of paper, but Appendix 1 is just the cover letter that we sent to the ECLG. Uh, appendix 2 is probably the most useful appendix. That sets out the joint submission that was agreed with Greater Manchester and West Yorkshire. It provides more information around those four criteria and how we see ourselves achieving those. Um, it also sets out some of the, our initial thoughts about the, the most appropriate operating model. Uh, appendix 3 is the Memorandum of Understanding, which sets out uh, at a higher level the way in which the funds will work together. There are two exempt appendices. Appendix 4 uh, was a report commissioned from PwC, which sets out uh, some costs of, of different government arrangements. And then Appendix 5 really sits with it, which is legal advice we got um, in relation to government arrangements as well. Um, as we say um, in the report, the next step is that the government will evaluate the submissions that we've made against the pooling criteria, and we're hoping to get some feedback before the Easter recess, but we wait to hear on that. Uh, final proposals are due by the 15th of July uh, and officers intend to bring a draft final report proposal to this committee at the June meeting. Members will see from um, Appendix 2 that officers in the pool are working towards um, a so-called collective um, asset pooling arrangement really driven by a joint committee uh, and the, the advice and information we've had is around meeting procurement uh, requirements and more importantly ensuring that any arrangements that we propose don't breach financial services legislation. Uh, in particular the Financial Conduct Authority uh, is required to regulate any organisation or individuals that manage assets on behalf of other organisations. So in working together with the, the other funds we want to make sure that any arrangements we put in place don't breach the financial services legislation. I'm happy to go through any of the appendices uh, in more detail, but the recommendation is that members note the report and authorise officers to continue developing pooling options. Um, future papers for the committee will provide further information on likely costs, benefits um, and any material 
proposals uh, we have already incurred, uh, as I said, uh, <coughs> so Section 8, which I should have referred to, uh, a further contribution of £7,000 has been made towards the cost of the project pool report. Uh, but members will see from the PwC appendix for that there are very substantial costs involved in setting up uh, many pavilion arrangements uh, that, that really vary from about £1.2 million through to £14 or £15 million. Pounds. So there are potentially significant costs for, for the pool and we'll be sharing some of those costs depending on mainly on
teachers will inform back on the appointments um, of independent proxy uh, valuers.
consistency of reporting, we can measure that, we can then manage it, and we can then take steps to reduce the farm's carbon footprint. Uh, so on section 2.5, we suggest that an area where members can consider um, taking some steps to reduce the farm's carbon footprint is in relation to the two passive mandates that we have, one in the UK and one in the US. Um, this would be a way of, of managing our passive assets uh, and looking to decarbonise them without taking undue investment risk, and although it would have increased cost considerations, we feel it's right to consider that money, it's appropriate to spend money uh, in terms of managing the risk, such as carbon risk. Uh, so, at the, at the bottom of the fourth page, um, we do say that such an approach would not be without risks and costs, but the practical considerations are set out below that officers would consider a number of low-carbon indices. Uh, we look at those on the basis of their ability to deliver a carbon reduction benefit. We point out the need to have a higher tracking error uh, for the mandates, and that it will probably be implemented through a, a managed account, which is the segregated mandate, which would increase both the transaction costs and the ongoing management costs. There would be a higher investment management 2.6, we explain why we feel it's less appropriate to extend carbon reduction objectives to the fund's active mandates, but nonetheless the fund should seek to better understand the climate risk exposure of these portfolios. Then under section 2.7, uh, we effectively extract a table from the appendix, which goes through four stages, a, a strategic review, followed by strategic asset allocation, followed by either mitigation actions or adaptation actions. And in the table, um, under each of those four headings, we make some suggested actions. In the third column, we set out the fund's current response to investment policy. And then in the fourth column, we, we set out some potential actions that officers consider um, could be appropriate for the fund. Um, Clearly, we're seeking the views of members as to whether we should take some or all of those forward. Uh, under section three, we set out the relevant risks. Uh, climate change is a systemic risk with major implications for a long-term investor, such as Merseyside Pension Fund, and we feel it's appropriate to have a proactive and precautionary approach. However, an ill-considered and hastily implemented decarbonisation plan may jeopardise investment strategy objectives. Under section 8, we say something about the costs. Uh, clearly, as we, we work, if, if approved towards some of these goals, there will be greater clarity that we can report back to committee um, on, the, on the costs of the strategy. Uh, so, the recommendation under section 13 is that an initial decarbonisation plan for the Merseyside Pension Fund be progressed to encompass carbon footprinting of listed equities reduction of exposure in the passive equities portfolio and secondly a strategic review be initiated along the lines set out in the uh, attached appendix with an updated policy statement on climate change to be included in the forthcoming investment strategy statement. Happy to answer questions, Chair. Peter, thank you for that. Very detailed report and all the work that's gone into it. And Trina? Thanks for that, Peter. No, um, I welcome that the fund recognises the need for the Brexit plan for decarbonisation. And I understand that there's a lot of work um, in relation to risk on data collection, cost, and etc. However, I do welcome the recognition that the fund should <coughs> seek to better understand the kind of risk exposure. And I welcome that managers could also be required to uh, include climate risk in their reporting going forward. So. Very much, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to put on record my thanks to all of the forum for the work that's put in on this issue. I'm very happy, obviously, the committee has taken this particular topic forward. Um, just a couple of things I've drawn out of um, the report is that it specifically mentions on page three that you know France has introduced rules compelling carbon disclosure by institutional investors. 
strategy statement. <coughs> that's something that's being brought in with the new investment regulations. So without avoiding timing on that, we're still waiting for the government to issue the revised um, investment regulations. And on the back of that, we'll be able to work towards an investment strategy statement. Clearly, the existing statement we have in our, our SIP, our Statement of Investment Principles at the moment, does enable us to, to continue to work towards um, carbon, managing carbon, because it's something we identify in our responsible investment policy. But the likelihood is that the investment strategy statement uh, won't be drafted until certainly the end of this year and early next year uh, to coincide.
Centre is set out in the attached report from the CBRE that's attached as an exempt appendix. In terms of background, January 2013, committee gave approval for an extensive redevelopment of Times Bay Square. Good progress has been made in preparing the design works, achieving the necessary planning approvals, procurements, and all the other prerequisites for construction works to begin. CBRE continue to work closely with the developers in managing the project and a status report has been prepared by them which is attached that makes recommendations in terms of the key future actions required to take the scheme forward. Um, officers have discussed this uh, proposal too with CBRE and we're, we're happy that uh, it is expected to make a profit for the fund from the development. Um, as I say we're also looking for the developers Queensbury to attend a future IMWP to update members uh, on the plans. So in terms of uh, the recommendation that uh, members approve the report, uh, just, just to mention uh, under, under section 11 that um, the developer is required to achieve a GRIAM score of good
dependencies and, and items. Um, so, in accordance with the standing orders, it's recommended under section 100A for the Local Government Act 1972 that publicly excluded from the meeting during consideration the following item of business on the grounds that they involve the length of disclosure of exempt information as defined by the relevant paragraphs of part one of schedule 12A of amendments to the Act. Public interest test has been applied and favours exclusion. Uh, so the agenda items are there. And uh, so is anyone happy to propose that? A second? Yeah? Second and three then. Okay. So thank you for that. It's agreed. So can I thank you for your attendance tonight's meeting? Thank you.